if you have your Bibles this morning, we'll be in the book of Obadiah. We'll be in the book of Obadiah. And if you're not sure where that is, because it's in the Minor Prophets, it is right after the book of Amos and right before the book of Jonah. And while you are turning there, I just want to say thank you to Pastor Matthew and the other elders for giving me the joy and of having the pulpit this morning. And I believe that the pulpit ought to be heavily guarded. So thank you, dear elders of Texarkana Reformed Baptist Church for allowing me to preach this morning. When I thought about what to bring to this congregation with it being very close to the Christmas season, with it being very close to the New Year, I thought we must think much upon the wrath of Almighty God. We must think much upon the wrath of Almighty God. Because if you think about the reason why Jesus came, the reason why Jesus came was to take the wrath of God on the cross for sinners. More specifically, to take the wrath of God on behalf of His people. And in this Christmas season, you will hear a lot of sermons if you just surf the web on the birth of Christ from the four Gospels. From, you'll hear sermons on the Incarnation. And all those are right and well and proper <coughs> because they are in the Word. And they should be preached. All Scripture is profitable, right? That's what Paul told Timothy. But you must remember the context of that Scripture. The Gospels were just being circulated at that time. There was no Bible in the way that we have it now with all the books neatly organized in the 66 books. When Paul wrote that to Timothy, he was talking about the Old Testament, the law, the poetry, the prophets, and indeed the minor prophets. So when we look at this text this morning, you aren't going to find much of what the world would talk about with Christmas cheer. You won't find much joy. Obadiah is a book of judgment, but it's a unique book of judgment because this book unlike other prophetic books, does not center around the northern and southern kingdoms of Israel and Judah. This book centers around Edom. This book centers around the nation that came out of the offspring of Esau. And in this text this morning, what I want us to see is the Lord's defense of His people. The Lord's defense of His people. And it's only one chapter long, 21 verses to be exact. And the Scriptures in this, as I've already said, do not have much grace. We live in a day where it's hard for us to hear sermons that don't have much grace. But you're going to get to this morning. And when you look at this text, I want you to come away thanking the Lord that Christ took your wrath upon the cross. So with that said, let's go to Him in prayer. 
Father, I thank you that your local church in this context will be able to celebrate the Christmas season with joy, knowing that Jesus came once to take away our wrath for those of us who know you. I pray, O oh Lord, that we would look at this book and be able to glean from it how much you care for us. You cared for the nations of Israel and Judah, and you, you care for us as your New Testament people. And I pray, O oh Lord, that in your sovereignty, you would have us come away from this book more in love with you, more in love with your gospel. And I pray, O oh Lord, that we would never look at this book again the same way. I pray indeed that some of us in here who have never seriously studied this book would find this to perhaps be one of their favorite books of Scripture. And Father, may we take comfort as we go through this text that you love your people and you are a God who cares how your people are treated. It's in your Son's name that we pray. Amen. <clears throat> so if you're taking notes, I have four points that I want to make from this book this morning. The first one is found in verses 1 through 9. And instead of what I normally do with most passages of reading the entire morning's passage and then expounding, I will read and expound as I go because of the nature of how this book is written. I think it's easiest to explain it that way. So I want us to first look at the complete judgment of God upon Edom. The complete judgment of God upon the nation of Edom. And we find that in the first nine verses. God says through the prophet Obadiah, the vision of Obadiah, thus says the Lord God concerning Edom, we have heard a report from the Lord, and an envoy has been sent among the nations, saying, Arise, and let us go against her for battle. Behold, I will make you small among the nations. You are greatly despised. The arrogance of your heart has deceived you. You who live in the clefts of the rock, in the loftiness of your dwelling place, who say in your heart, Who will bring me down to the earth? Though you build high like the eagle, though you set your nest among the stars, from there I will bring you down, declares the Lord. If thieves come to you, if robbers by night, oh, how you will be ruined. Would they not steal only until they had enough? If grape gatherers came to you, would they not leave some gleanings? Oh, how Esau will be ransacked, and how his hidden treasures searched out. All the men allied with you will send you forth to the border. And the men at peace with you will deceive you and overpower you. They who eat your bread will set an ambush for you. There is no understanding in them. Will I not on that day, declares the Lord, destroy wise men from Edom and understanding from the mountain of Esau? Then your mighty men will be dismayed, O Teman, so that everyone may be cut off from the mountain of Esau by slaughter. That is the God that I serve. 
That is the God, if you are a Christian, that you serve. In these verses, what we see here is the ministry of Obadiah. And it's the farthest thing from Joel Osteen that one could ever get. You will never hear a sermon like this preached out of Lakewood Church in Houston. Because there is nothing pretty about this. There is nothing pretty about what we see in these texts. Because we see this is a message. My New American Standard here says an envoy. I think the ESV says, and a message has been sent among the nations. They're about to go to war. And look at what the Lord says. He says to Edom in verse 2. I will make you small among the nations. And then he says in verse 3 why he's going to do this. The arrogance of your heart has deceived you. And he is saying that even though you live in the clefts of the rocks and that you are high up, I'm going to bring you down, he says a little later. You see, the nation of Edom what they would do is they would make their dwelling places high in the caves. And when, when other nations would be coming along, they would actually come down and attack them. So they actually thought themselves to be militarily superior to the other nations. They thought that they could not be defeated in battle. And we see that here, don't we, in verse 3. The arrogance of your heart has deceived you. And then he goes on in the latter part of verse 3 to say, You who say in your heart, Who will bring me down to earth? You see, this nation thought themselves superior to all others around them. And the Lord says, though you build high like the eagle, though you set your nest among the stars, from there, look at what it says, don't miss this, I will bring you down, declares the Lord. Don't miss that little phrase, declares the Lord. When God says that, and He is speaking this directly in the first person, it is sure to be done. And I look at this and I tremble at our own country because I see arrogance very much the same with us. We think that we are militarily superior, but we should read Obadiah and we should realize in this text that God, whenever He wants to, can bring judgment upon our country in a very swift way for abortion. For the sin of abortion. There is a very real sense in which I think the sins of abortion are already a judgment on our country as well. But what we see in this text at this point is that the nation of Edom has been, will be brought down low. And then he goes on to say in verses 5 and 6 through 9, he says, If thieves come to you, if robbers by night, oh, how you'll be ruined. Would they not steal only until they had enough? And then he goes on to describe grape gatherers the same way. And what he's doing here is he's saying, My judgment is far superior to any man. You see, if a thief comes and robs you, it's going to eventually end. It will be incomplete and in some sense unfulfilled. And the reason why he brings out great, great gatherers is because in that day to have an abundance of wine would have been a sign that you were blessed in those cultures back in that day. And God's saying, I'm going to take away what you hold dear. I'm going to take away your sense of blessing. 
and I'm going to bring you down low. And then in verse 6, you see that the writer uses the vocative. He says, Oh, how Esau will be ransacked, and his hidden treasures searched out. So he can see the horror that the Lord is going to bring down upon the nation of Edom. And it doesn't stop there. Not only will their blessings be taken away, not only will their sense of military superiority be crushed, but even those whom they count as friends will eventually become to be their enemy, and they will be turned upon. And God says in verse 8, Will I not on that day, declares the Lord, destroy wise men from Edom and understanding from the mountain of Esau? Then your mighty men will be dismayed, O Teman, so that everyone may be cut off from the mountain of Esau by slaughter. I said this in a sermon last week, but I think it bears repeating to this congregation. The world is perfectly fine with a nativity scene of a little baby Jesus. The world is perfectly fine with you worshiping that Jesus as long as he stays a baby and only comes out at Christmas time for people to goo goo and gaga at. But the real God of Scripture is what we just read about. And we as confessional Christians, we believe and hold to the Trinity that Jesus Christ has always been God and will forever be God. You know what that means? If we, if we can do a little bit of systematic theology here and correlate scriptures together, that means that, friends, listen to me, if Jesus is God Almighty, that means he was present upon the prophet Obadiah when he spoke these words. Do you understand the gravity of that? That not only was Jesus being God present, but he was in agreement. There's a sense in which he himself was the one that spoke this condemnation upon the people of Edom. Is that your Jesus? That's my Jesus. That is the one who will come back as we will see in our text a little later on and judge the world with a fist of righteousness. And he will tread the wine press of the wrath of God. Now, why do I go there? What we will see a little later on in our text is this judgment to the people of Edom to the lion of Esau it is only a picture of the terrible judgment that will come so we see in the first nine verses just how terrible God's wrath will be upon this people and we know it is because of their arrogance that they lift themselves up in military pride, that they believe themselves to be better than all others. And God's going to take away their military superiority. God is going to take away their military friends, their allies. God is going to take away their blessings. God is going to utterly destroy them. And He's perfectly right and just in doing so because He is God. So we've seen that in the first nine verses. I want us to see in verses 10 through 14, this is my second point, if you're taking notes, the more specific reason as to why they are being judged. Everything we just talked about was the judgment upon them. Now I want us to see exactly why they're being judged. And we see that 
from verses 10 through 14. This word right here is very important in verse 10 because he's going to give them the reason why of violence to your brother Jacob. You will be covered with shame and you will be cut off forever. On that day you stood aloof. On that day that strangers carried off his wealth and foreigners entered his gate and cast lots for Jerusalem. You too were as one of them. Keep that in mind as we go on. You too were as one of them. Verse 12, Do not gloat over your brother's day, the day of his misfortune, and do not rejoice over the sons of Judah in the day of their destruction. Yes, do not boast in the day of their distress. Do not enter the gate of my people in the day of their disaster. Yes, you do not gloat over their calamity. Yes, you who do not gloat over their calamity. Keep that in mind. There's a reason why I've repeated it. In the day of their disaster, and do not loot their wealth in the day of their disaster. Do not stand at the fork of the road to cut down their fugitives, and do not imprison their survivors in the day of their distress. Now, when we get to these verses, the main point that Obadiah is getting across through his writing, and consequently the Lord as well, the Lord is saying that you have acted like pagan nations. Because, unless you remember, Esau, whom the Edomites descended from, was related to Jacob, who the people of Israel descended from. So, all throughout the scriptures before this prophecy, <laughs> what you see in the narrative text is many, many times where the Edomites did not come to the help of Israel when they should have. But instead, they not only did not help them as they should have, they actually were perpetrators in the crime. They acted as one of the pagan nations. He says in verse 11, On that day you stood aloof, on the day that strangers carried off his wealth, and foreigners entered his gate, and cast lots for Jerusalem. You were as one of them. That's why he goes into the next series of verses into the do, into the do not section. And he says, don't act like one of them, essentially. Because if you look at this text, what you will find is he's telling them, do not act like the pagan nations. Don't do what they do. Don't follow their practices. But apparently they have. And God, in his just justice, is reminding them of everything of which they are guilty of before their cousin nation, their brother Jacob. And I look at this and I think to myself how much rejoicing this book caused the people of Israel and Judah. You see, because God is judging justice. And everything that he's talked about thus far, if you look at this book, what you will see up to this point is God says on that day, the Israelites and the Judahites are looking forward to that day when God in his righteousness and his justice will pour out judgment upon the Edomites. They rejoice at that prophecy and they look to that day. But 
in verse 15 through the rest of the book, what we will see is that the attention of the book shifts from the Edomites to the rest of the nations. And in this section, what we will see is that that day becomes the day. The day. So if you're taking notes, the third and final point will be the day of the Lord will cause much rejoicing and much horror. The day of the Lord will cause much rejoicing and much horror. You've got all three of my points now. And if you wrote them down, you probably realized I'm not a very good Baptist because none of that alliterates. But I don't really care about that. I want to be faithful to this text. And that is what the next set of verses in the book of Obadiah teach us. In verse 15 through 21. The day of the Lord will bring about much horror and much joy. So we have seen the judgment of God upon the Edomites in our first point, and we have seen in our second point the absolute reason why they're being judged is because they were acting like enemies when they should have been their allies. When they should have done them right, they did them wrong. So for our final point, let's read what the Lord says in verses 15 through 21 of Obadiah. For the day of the Lord draws near on all the nations. As you have done, it will be done to you. Your dealings will return on your own head. Because just as you drank on my holy mountain, all the nations will drink continually. And they will drink and swallow and become as if they have never existed. But, on Mount Zion, there will be those who escape. And it will be holy. And the house of Jacob will possess their possessions. Then the house of Jacob will be a fire. And the house of Joseph a flame. But the house of Esau will be a stubble. And they will set them on fire and consume them so that there will be no survivor of the house of Esau, for the Lord has spoken. Then those of the Negev will possess the mountain of Esau, and those of the Shephelah, the Philistine plain, also possibly the territory of Ephraim and the territory of Samaria, and Benjamin will possess Gilead, and the exiles of this host of the sons of Israel who are among the Canaanites as far as Zarephath, and the exiles of Jerusalem who are in Seraphon will possess the cities of the Negev. The deliverers will ascend Mount Zion to judge the mountain of Esau, and the kingdom will be the Lord's. So I told you my third point is simply the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord will be a day of both great horror and great rejoicing. Now, and we see the horror in verses 15 and 16, if you want to put that down in your notes. It's a recapitulation, if you will, of the judgment that we already saw in verses 1 through 9. Except this time the judgment will be upon all the nations. And we, what we see is that it will be absolutely complete. And he says, it's near and it's coming. And people will be repaid for their sin. And he uses this language of drinking and drunkenness throughout. 
and the judgment of the Lord will be so terrible and so final and so complete that the scripture says in verse 16, it will become as if they had never existed. Again, let me say, this is my God. This is your God, if you are indeed a Christian. You know, I hear folks say all the time, oh, the God of the Old Testament is so mean and capricious and zaps everybody every time he gets a chance. But the God of the New Testament, Jesus, he's a God of love. They don't understand the Scriptures. Because what we will see, if you look at Revelation chapter 19, as I've already said, Jesus will come back and He will tread the fury of the winepress of Almighty God. And on that day, which I believe is the same day of which Obadiah is talking about here, justice will be done. You know, there's a lot to talk about justice nowadays. But we must remember that as far as God's concerned, justice is absolute. It's just as complete as what we read in the Scriptures here. Because what we see in these Scriptures, again, look at verse 18, the final phrase. For the Lord has spoken. That is true not only of the destruction of the house of Esau and the Edomites. That will be true on the great day of the Lord when He makes all things right. You know, there's a song that gets sung a lot of times at Christmas. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. I'm not going to sing it. Y'all don't want that. But what we see in that song if you think about it in terms of the first coming of Christ, it makes no sense. Because we live in a world that is mostly joyless. We live in a world ravaged by sin. When Isaac Watts, this hymn writer, wrote that hymn and composed that music, he had in mind Obadiah's The Day of the Lord. And we see that joy to the world expressed in conquering. Again, military language here. All this possession talk. And commentators debate about what exactly all this means. But the main point is very, very clear. And we see that in the last part of verse 21. And the kingdom will be the Lord. That is our Christmas hope, dear friends. That, my friends, is the reason why we can have joy in a world that sees Christmas and celebrates it in such materialism. We have hope. See, I told you there's no grace in this book. I did not tell you that there's no hope. Because what we see in verse 21, after all this conquering and after all this claiming of land, what we will see in verse 21 is deliverers will ascend Mount Zion. I think the ESV says saviors there. So what we see is that the Lord will take care of His people, even though they have been mistreated and judged by the Edomites. And it makes me think about the greater sacrifice and the greater Savior of the Lord Jesus Christ who came down to earth as a little baby, yes. But He didn't stay that way. He grew in wisdom and knowledge perfectly, kept the law of God that these Edomites and these Israelites broke. And He fulfilled every righteous demand of the perfect law of Almighty God. <coughs> and when He had gotten done, fulfilled that, the, the Lord put Him up on a cruel cross. And He stood in the place of all His elect people chosen before the foundations in the world. And he died on their behalf. He was our propitiation. 
He took the wrath of God for us, for those who believe. And it not only stops there, He rose again from the dead. And we serve a Savior who is alive. That is the whole point of Christmas. Christmas ought to lead us to the joy of what we call Easter. And Easter ought to be the biggest day of celebration for believers. But in a world full of materialism, it's really hard to see that sometimes. The ending of the Christmas story is found in Easter, but Easter doesn't end. Easter's going to end on the last day when the trump sounds and the Lord comes back and He will possess His kingdom through all His elect people. Now, when, when I look at this text, it's very easy for me to ask, so what? This, this is a very specific text of Scripture in Obadiah. Until you get to the last six verses, it's very specific. So what can we learn from Obadiah? Well, I've got one big application point for everyone this morning. And sometimes the application isn't so much doing something as it is changing your belief about something or more pointedly, hoping in something. And here's this something that I want you to hope in this morning. The Lord defends His people because He is a good God. Everything that is true about this text ultimately applies to you too because you, dear friends, as this local church for each individual that has personally placed their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and turned away from their sins. The Lord cares just as much about you as He cared for the nations of Israel and Judah in this text. And when you think about that, that gives you strength to keep on going throughout the day. When you have those who persecute you, you know that the Lord cares for you and He's not uncaring about what you're going through. And what we see in this text, dear ones, is that we see that all evil will one day be vanquished forever. And it will be complete. It will be swift. It will be right. And yes, I believe in the Evangelism. I love evangelism because that is the only way whereby men will be saved. But on that day, on the day of the Lord, dear ones, we won't have to be evangelizing anymore because on the day of the Lord, all evil will be vanquished. And even though it may be hard for you to think about loved ones or people that you know that are under the wrath of God in hell. On that day, you will look at perfect, beautiful justice. And you, like the ones in Revelation, will give a fourfold hallelujah. And I admit, we cannot wrap our minds around that this side of heaven. But on that day, when we see perfect, beautiful justice, meted out to all those who are evil, we're going to worship Him for all eternity because He's worshipped. He is to be worshipped and He is to be praised because as this text ends with, the kingdom is the Lord's. So I want you to think upon the judgment of Almighty God. Contemplate what you deserve. You deserve everything and more that the Edomites got. You deserve an eternity in hell right alongside the demons. That's what we deserve. We deserve God's wrath and judgment. But God has given us the hope found 
in Christ. So, I say to you who are Christians, truly I hope you have a Merry Christmas thinking about this and meditating upon it. But for those of you who are not Christmas, who are not Christians, your Merry Christmas will be a hollow emptiness because when you die, you will stand before God and on that day, you will be right with the Edomites. Guilty, condemned, poor, and helpless. May it not be so. Turn from your sins while you have opportunity this side of heaven. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you so much for these people. I thank you for the work that Pastor Matthew and the other elders are doing in this church. I pray that you would bless it. I pray that their tribe would increase. Uh, uh, just think about the ministry of evangelism that the believers here are doing like uh, I believe it was shown you. I pray that more of that would happen as we anticipate the great day of the Lord. May we come before your throne worshipful every Sunday, joyous and ready to go and be with you for all eternity and worship you. Father, I pray if there's any that does not know your Son, that you would be kind to them. You would be merciful to them. They would repent.